good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's very impressive, I have to say. Um, so uh, I'm very delighted to uh, present some experimental work we did uh, at Leiden University about um, bipolar and envelope percussion in own quartz uh, in, in the Roberg of South Africa. Yeah, I will speak in English and the slides are also in English, but I understand French questions. My French, not so well. Um, so uh, for the Roberg, I will explain a little bit because we change chronology quite, quite a bit. Uh, from uh, from the lower Paleolithic now. So the Roberg uh, is um, a techno complex of the later Stone Age, uh, and it is one of the two earlier phases of the later Stone Age. So it dates to between 25 to uh, 12,000 BP. Um, the Roberg is characterized by a microlithic technology. So the technology aims to produce uh, bladelets and small flakes. Uh, there are different reduction strategy involved for producing uh, the standardized elements, which you can see uh, here. Um, also, the, the robot is uh, supposed to be uh, characterized by uh, the common use of uh, bipolar percussion. What is specific about the robot that there are not a lot of tools and the tool corpus mostly is composed of modified bladelets, denticulates and um, scrapers. Within the Rohrbeck, there is a regional variability or regional adaptations. So in mostly in the west, uh, northwest of South Africa, uh, there's a lot of quartz used. In the other regions, um, other raw materials used. And in this region, regions where uh, quartz is mostly used, uh, there's a significance of bipolar percussion. So here you can see uh, the distribution of robot sites within South Africa, and you can see it concerns the whole uh, subcontinent. Um, we have um, two case studies that I will present today uh, that we are working on currently. The one is uh, Umschlatzana Rock Shelter, this one here, and uh, the other one is Heuninges Kans. Uh, first, Umschlatzana Rock Shelter. Um, this site was excavated in 1985 by Jonathan Kaplan, and he identified uh, Rohrberg layers that date to between uh, 27,800 to 13,400. And you can see uh, the, the drawings that he published are not quite microlithic, but I can promise you they are also microlithic. He just didn't uh, publish them or draw them. Um, the problem with Umschlag Sana, why it was not so much considered in the South African uh, discourse about uh, the Rohrberg is that uh, Kaplan uh, described a, a slumping event. So he, he was talking about rotational slipping of uh, the layers. So that's why the community didn't really um, include uh, Umschlag Sana for the discussion about the Rohrberg or only with caution. Um, thanks. Or gratefully, uh, the, the university, Leiden University, under the direction of Gerrit Düsseldorf, um, continued or did a new project at Umschlag Sana Rock Shelter in 2018 and 2019. And they did a really uh, high quality and high profile uh, geoarchaeological investigation to show, which could then actually show that there was no large scale movement. So the site uh, could be considered or could really be considered for discussions about the chronocultural um, framework. And what you can see here, these are the layers that concern the Rohrberg. Um, what I forgot to mention before, Umschlatusana is um, located in KwaZulu Natal and in the Indian Ocean uh, belt biome. Um, here you can see some of the products that we identified. Um, here, a course that uh, accord to bipolar percussion. So when I speak about bipolar percussion, I refer to Keller in 1987. So I mean real actual axial uh, bipolar percussion. So uh, here you can see a course that include, or the, the bipolar reduced pieces that include uh, bladelet cores, um, pieces, pieces uh, and rice grain cores. They have um, linear and chisel-like uh, platforms. Most of them have a plain parallel or triangular shape. Uh, they show typical features of bipolar percussion and occasionally exhausted cores um, were in the last phase um, exploited by bipolar percussion. These are some of the products. Here you can see uh, the bladelets that show um, 
traces of bipolar percussion. And here are some of the, um, the flakes that were produced. Uh, I know the, 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 the correct term is Lyman slice, but uh, our um, Nepper used the term uh, mandarin flake. And uh, yeah, we, we use it, let's say, just a little bit as a personal joke, but we like the term very much. So these are the, the mandarin flakes. Um, then we also observed cores that are different, that more accord to anvil percussion, so more uh, oblique or slant, uh, slanted uh, percussion. Uh, this cores, uh, the exhausted cores, they have um, quite a flatness in the longitudinal and transversal convexity at the end. They have plain platforms. They also show um, traces of repercussion or, or crushing uh, at, the, uh, at the base. And it seems that sometimes, or when we can identify it, uh, that the um, reduction strategy started with freehand percussion, then uh, ended with um, anvil percussion. So this was complementary. And this was probably used to uh, control the convexity, to stabilize, to um, avoid accidents, and to keep the uh, reduction sequence going as long as possible. We also identified this was uh, quite a nice finding, a large uh, sandstone slab that showed uh, rounded uh, packing marks on, on the planar face. You can see that here. And um, they should be um, diagnostic for contact with uh, hard mineral material. So this could be an anvil or a hammerstone. Um, coming to Honingskrans, which is uh, located in, the, in Limpopo, quite close to another very important site, Bushman Rock Shelter. It has a um, there was one section uh, or one trench uh, excavated uh, sondage by uh, Peter Beaumont in 1968. He did this in one week. Um, this section is more than six meters long, and he only identified three um, macro uh, strata. You can see because he didn't uh, he he described that he didn't see a lot of natural differentiation. But as you can see, yeah, when you look carefully and excavate a little bit uh, longer than a week, there are uh, differences. Um, he, he divided, so these uh, three macro phases that he divided, the third one dates pre-last uh, glacial maximum and was described as a robot by Peter Beaumont. Um, new excavations are taking place since um, 2018 uh, by Guillaume Porras and, or, the, or under the direction by um, Guillaume Porras and Aurore Wall. And the layers concerning, again, the, the uh, before identified uh, rawberg, they include, as you can see here, uh, also uh, anvils. And concerning the products, there are also cores that show um, bipolar percussion or anvil percussion. And what we can see here, sorry, uh, the, the bladelets that also show traces of um, bipolar percussion. So this is... Um, the status quo of, of our study, so to say, at that point before the experiments. And then we wanted to know uh, if we could differentiate between anvil and bipolar, uh, bipolar percussion on the course and, and the products, if there are diagnostic stigmata. Then we wanted to explore further um, if different techniques, uh, including the use of anvil, can be combined in one chain laboratoire. And then we also wanted to know or, or see uh, how this anvil assisted course. Um, may provide or may provide it more efficiency and standardization within the microlithic technology of, of the Rawberg. And then generally, we also wanted to enlarge our knowledge on um, techniques uh, involving the application of ANVIL. So um, we prepared a protocol. Uh, before the experiment, uh, the preparation included uh, the documentation of the cores and hammerstones. We used um, both for the um, cores quartz, uh, it's, it's quartz, and also for the hammerstones, we used quartz. Uh, and then we created a, a documentation sheet um, to record every core and, um, yeah, to record every core. Then for the realization, um, we recorded everything uh, with photo and video. We did also analog recording. So we, um, we wrote everything down on our doc documentation sheet, and then we collected all the pieces, bagged them, and labeled the bags according uh, to our description. Uh, the the post-experimental data collection then um, concerned uh, a database that we created beforehand, which um, which included some uh, literature review 
on which attributes could be usable or could be useful for our um, for our adventure, so to say. And we also photograph, this is still in progress, photograph and document all the exhausted cores and products. Um, now to the experiments. Um, Morgan Roussel uh, from Leiden University conducted all the experiments. He's very, um, he's very experienced in bladelet production, but I think uh, the bipolar was a new uh, approach for him. Um, here you can see, so now are some impressions. Here's the freehand percussion that we did. Um, we did then also bipolar percussion to uh, split the cobbles. Here you can see uh, the successful production of the mandarin shaped uh, flakes. Uh, then we used um, anvil percussion. We also used anvil percussion to um, on some of the flakes that we produced beforehand uh, with bipolar percussion, some of the mandarin shaped uh, flakes, as then um, further as cores in anvil percussion. You can see that here, experiment 9A uh, concerned one of this ramified or integrated cores. Um, and then, and then um, in the last, uh, or the last technique that we also used was animal percussion with claims. So concerning our preliminary results, um, we, we had a lot of test phases, so to say, that we started with number nine. So these are the six experiments that, um, that we completed. Uh, the suffix, uh, the letter suffix is, uh, these are the, the ramified or the integrated cores. Um, here you can see um, what technique was used and how the core was fixed, um, especially in the, uh, or actually only in the experiments 10B and 10C, we used uh, anvil with clamps, that's important. Um, and here you can see the, the blade, blade output, the productivity. So we had a lot of intentions to produce uh, bladelets, you can see that here, but uh, in the end, we had an output of uh, 25, so around 25% um, of bladelets from the intended bladelet production. And most of them come from uh, clamps and uh, cores that were um, in a clamp. Uh, so here to, to emphasize this one more time, most of the bladelets come from uh, experiments 10B and 10C where we use um, cores in a clamp. Uh, here are some of the, the products, some of the bladelets that were produced. Uh, and as I said, just to emphasize this again, most of them derive from uh, anvil percussion with claims. So yeah, uh, the results are, are very preliminary. We will continue, of course. Actually, I'm going to Leiden next week and we will uh, continue with Morgan Roussel. But uh, as uh, conclusions so far, um, we can, this is not a surprise, we can distinguish between freehand and bipolar percussion um, uh, of the, the cores and products of quartz, but uh, for anvil and bipolar percussion, only the cores show um, suggestive uh, traces, I would say. Uh, then um, for the cobble splitting with bipolar percussion, we produce this mandarin shaped flakes and they could be then optimal, optimally used uh, to further exploit them with anvil assisted cores. So yes, uh, more uh, or at least these two techniques or even three with the claims uh, can be involved in one chain, chain operatoire uh, combined. And then um, this was a very nice result. So this was uh, the piece that I want to emphasize now the most is that the clamp, um, the cores in the claims or the fixation of the cores in the claims really helped to to stabilize, to control, to standardize, and um, with the efficiency. So this is really a way to ec economize the production of bladelets, and this might be a way how the Nepos in the Roberg um, implemented this. Uh, merci beaucoup. <laughs>